Welcome to the Provoke and Inspire podcast, learning how to follow Jesus in a post-Christian culture. Uh, my name is Ben Pierce. I'm the host of the show. To my right is Aaron Pierce. It's the family episode you've all been longing for. Uh, we actually have taken the entire month of August off, and so this is fresh for me. Uh, Luke, David, and Chad, who you are also familiar with, uh, I don't know where they are. They, they are gallivanting across the globe somewhere. Uh, but next week, we will all be back together, uh, bringing you fresh new content, so we're excited about that. Uh, but we have an amazing show for you today. We have a guest, Peter Greer. Uh, he is an author, speaker, and president and CEO of Hope International. Uh, it's a global Christ-centered economic development organization uh, that serves throughout Asia, uh, Africa, Latin America, and Eastern Europe. Uh, we both, uh, actually per Aaron's recommendation, just finished his book, Rooting for Rivals, uh, How Collaboration and Generosity Increase the Impact of Leaders, Charities, and Churches. Uh, I mentioned uh, to Peter before we started that this was a bit of a kick in the butt because we live in a culture, you know, I want to say American and Western, but it's it's really global, I think, uh, that praises growth and growth at all cost and growth early and uh, success and ambition and accomplishment. Uh, and, and quite frankly, this can be a real trap. Um, I, I think if you've been listening or paying attention to the Christian news cycle at all, uh, there's been... Um, you know, some some new stories that have been kind of looked at again in terms of the, the pitfalls and risks of growth at all cost and platform and ambition. Uh, and so we're going to have this conversation. How can we want to change the world, uh, but do it in a way that honors Jesus uh, and actually models the way he did it? So we're looking forward to that conversation. Um, but just real quickly, we always want to mention this podcast is part of a larger global missions movement called Steiger. Uh, and Aaron is going to give you 30 seconds on what Steiger is, and then I'm going to play a short video, and then we'll bring on our guest. Yep, so we're just this global mission. Our whole heart is how can we mobilize the church? How can we mobilize followers of Jesus to reach young people that would not walk into a church? And this is an issue that is certainly an issue we're facing in the U.S. where I live, but it's a global issue um, that's been sparked by this global culture, global youth culture of young people all over the planet that are influenced by similar voices. And, and are generally buying into a secular humanistic worldview and are walking away from the church. So our heart is how can we mobilize the church to go after them? And that, that's really our passion, and we're seeing that playing out in cities all over the planet, and, and there's a place for you to be part of that. And that's a lot of what this podcast is about, is how can we mobilize you to engage a post-Christian secularized culture right where you are? Yeah. And so, yeah, we're, we're excited to see what God is doing and to continue to build this thing. Yeah. Uh, all right. Now, uh, bringing on to the Provoke and Inspire podcast, our guest for today, Peter Greer. Hey, what's up, man? Peter, man, thank you. Great to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's a real honor. And uh, I think Aaron wants to kick us off here. So, yeah, Peter, it's such an honor to have you on the podcast. I It's interesting because I um, I read I read your book. Someone recommended it to me a while back. I read it. Um, and I think the reason I wanted you on the podcast, because I feel like this book challenges me in the ways that I'm most vulnerable. Like it's the things that most, it's probably like, it's what I struggle with most. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, I need this because I, I'm, I'm, Ben and I, like if you do the strength finders, you know, personality profile, we both have like competitive as number one. Right. And I've often seen that. And I've fortunately gotten, not actually number one. It but. is for me. Yeah. But so <laughs> the, the point is like, I struggle with like the way God has wired me is to be very driven, very competitive. And I feel like if I'm in the business world, which I was before I was in missions, like that's cool. That's like a good thing. That's a, that's a strong thing. But then you apply that into the missional context and you're sometimes like, what do I do with that? So reading your book was really inspiring and convicting and challenging. And so I was like, man, I just, I, I got to get this guy on the podcast because I want to talk to him and learn more. So thank you for taking the time to be with us. Um, could you just tell us a little bit of your story, um, how you got to be where you are, and and what led you to write this book? Yeah, thanks. And, you know, maybe this is a support group with the three of us here, <laughs> but I similar have a similar wiring. And in many ways, really, the book is asking a question, great, we're competitive, but what are we competitive against? And if we are defining our competition as other organizations that are also trying to follow Jesus and make him known, maybe we should pause long enough and say, is that really who the competition is? And maybe we should have a different vision um, on that. So 
anyway, the, the real quick story is I uh, grew up as a pastor's kid in Massachusetts. And uh, speaking about competition, I mean, I still love cheering for my New England team. So don't hate me too much, mm, but that still? is, uh, that's, that's where I, that's where I grew up. And uh, I heard a, when I was in college, I was studying in Russia and heard someone who, you know, asked a, asked a question. He heard I had this interest in missions and this interest in business. And he said, have you ever heard of this new field of microenterprise development and microfinance? And, and I was hooked. This idea of using business as a way to alleviate extreme poverty by investing in the God-given capacity and potential that is hardwired in every single one of us and doing it in such a way that it is through the church, doing it in such a way that it's not just physical poverty, but then also addressing spiritual poverty and ultimately pointing people to Jesus. I was hooked um, on that. And that has been my career. So started in Cambodia and then spent time in Rwanda and then Zimbabwe and then uh, joined Hope International 17 years ago, really with this mission of saying, let's bring these tools that help create jobs and bring the hope of Jesus into places of extreme poverty around the world. So do that in 15 countries around the world. And then really the backstory of the book is, uh, it's very similar to what you just described. On my wall, I had a graph of the growth charts related to Hope International compared to the other Christian ministries that are in our same space. And that does horrible things to, to my heart. What does it do? They start having some great growth what am I doing? Oh man, why isn't that for me? What what am I doing wrong on that? Or or they start to tank. Wow, that that, that meant, well, look at look at how good I'm doing. Let me show you my graph uh, compared to theirs. So it doesn't matter if you're up or down, it's toxic on both ways. So really the book was exploring what is it that is at the root of rivalry, the root of unhealthy competition. And then exploring from some of the most open-handed and generous leaders that we could find, what is it that they think? What is it that they believe? What is their theology? And then what is their practice that allows them to become known for such open-handed generosity, both within and outside of their organizations? Yeah, that's awesome. It's, it's, it's interesting to me because this is such a subtle thing. It's easy to um, even deceive yourself, I think. You know, because you can say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ambitious for the Lord. I'm ambitious for the kingdom. I'm, I'm, I'm driving because I want to see people reached. And I remember a, a particular story for me is we were, um, we were seeing some pretty significant growth and impact in a particular country. And it was really exciting and, you know, big crowds and really massive impact. And that was like a really cool and exciting thing. And then what happened is there's another organization which I won't name, but they have a different but similar mission and they were doing things in a different area and then all of a sudden they expanded to the same country that we were and they started to have success and they were reaching people and I remember uh, like f this, this, this really bad feeling I felt about trying to find ways that I could minimize their success or say, oh, it's not real. Or, and I was just confronted by the darkness of my own heart because I was like, do I really care that these people are reached or do I care that we reach these people? And it's such a subtle thing. And I don't know if, if you've ever, I mean, I, obviously I think you have, but like, how do we, how do we deal with that self-deception that so often exists? Hmm. Yeah, again, I wish I wrote this book as an expert I wrote this uh, with Chris and with Jill as three individuals that are trying to figure this out. So the fun was actually going to other organizations, going to leaders and saying, tell us more. What is it? And then trying to synthesize that into some 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 elements. But I, I relate more than I wish I did uh, to what you were just sharing on that. And, you know, I think a, a huge piece of this, like fundamentally, a huge piece of this is the way that we do our math. Um, and if You've got an organization. I've gotten an organization. Let's just say two churches to keep it real simple. If someone leaves my church and goes to your church, but your church allows that individual to bring three more individuals, what's the math that we're doing on that? Am I negative one or are we actually plus three uh, on that? And I think that to me is this element of we've got to have a grander vision beyond organization. If we're thinking about what our organizations can do within our timeline, within our moment of leadership, we are thinking so far 
too small. We are we are thinking way too my we're looking way too myopically, and we got to get our eyes off of ourselves. We got to get our eyes on our Savior, and then say that's what we're about. And so, if anyone else is doing this work, if anyone else is trying to reach out, then they are not our competition. They are our brothers and our sisters. So let's live with more open handed generosity, and maybe give ourselves the gift of getting over ourselves. Yeah. So to take this, you know, I know that the concepts and principles in the book, and we can dig into those more, apply to any follower of Jesus. But for the for the person listening that says, I'm not a missional leader or I'm not a pastor, um, I'd imagine you'd agree. But I, I feel like there is a still a, a fundamental pull or this, this, this pull towards ambition and success, regardless of whatever field you're in. And, and there seems to be sort of a common reason for that or do you do you feel like that this idea or the ideas in this book apply to anybody listening how, how what does the person who maybe finds themselves outside of this context what do they how do they need to not root against their rivals or or buy into the ambition or success patterns of the world the same elements that stop organizations from living with open-handed generosity they are the exact same things that stop an individual from living with open-handed generosity. So I do think there's broad applicability, even if you're not in a position of whatever senior leadership uh, for a Christian ministry. Um, the, the, the big invitation, um, the big invitation is come, deny yourself uh, and follow me, right? That's, that's the core. And, and so what would be another way of saying that? Just don't put yourself at the center of the story. Live for a grander purpose. You want to find real generosity. You want to find real life. Um, I just think it is when we are no longer trying to be the star in our story and can get out of the way and have our focus beyond our organization and beyond ourselves and live into something that I just believe is so much better, so much more impactful, so much more exciting than just trying to be the starring role in your own little story. Yeah, it's so countercultural, right? I mean, it, it goes against the grain of human nature and pride, but it's even more so today. We live in a day that's so focused on uh, the pursuit, like wanting to go viral or, or accumulate numbers and followers and subscribers. And it's all about, I mean, there's even kind of a, a cultural gen younger generation thing about being the main character. And that, so it's, it's so, Jesus is called to deny yourself and pick up the cross is so countercultural and even more so today. And then it seeps into how we live as Christians. So it, how do we, you know, how do we not just know that, but actually live that? Or how do we begin to apply that in, in, in the life we live? I think there's two components to that. One is an actual thoughtful exercise to go through some big worldview questions. And then the second component is to go through the fake it till you make it, to actually do the practices that will over time actually influence our hearts. So just real quick, the two worldview questions that I think really stump, cause us to stumble in this one is, do we believe in a world of abundance or scarcity? If we believe in a world of scarcity, you're getting a little more means a little less for me. And we're going to fight over our little pieces of the pie. And I love how Melissa Russell, she works in fundraising for International Justice Mission. And I love talking with her because she had a friend came to came to her when the Ice Bucket Challenge was going on. And, and this whole thing about, oh, I wish all of this attention was for you and IJM. And that's from a good heart, right? It is because they care about the mission of IJM. But, but Melissa refused to look at the world through a lens of scarcity. And she said, imagine if you were a parent and your child had ALS and for the first time you felt like people were paying attention, how amazing would that be? And she said, I believe in a God who took five loaves and two fish and fed the multitudes. And I might add, and there was basketfuls of leftover. That is the God that she believes in. That is the God that I believe in, a God of abundance, not scarcity. And that allows us to be a little bit more open-handed. And then the second thing is, what do we think our calling is? And if we believe our calling is confined and constrained to our logo that is on our business card, then we are never going to be rooting for the other organizations. We're going to be subtly doing whatever it takes for our brand, for our reputation. And so these two worldviews of do you believe in a world of abundance or scarcity? And then do you believe your calling is for the kingdom of God or your little club? Those two questions are going to shape 
and then the practices that we can step into, that is about our time. How often do you actually get to know other individuals that the world would say, that's your competition? Are you Your prayer life, how much of them are focused on God's prayer for blessing to the other organizations that are in your space? How much of your money is given to the organizations that the world would look at and say, that's the competition? That's it. My church, I support my church. Guess what? I support the church down the road because I believe they're doing amazing work too. We So these, these, these decisions that we make to put principles into practice, what I have seen is it actually shapes and informs our heart and allows us to grow, to become into more collaborative, open-handed, generous. And as a result, I would say far more impactful leaders. Um, so good. This is like, I think, trying to even go another layer deeper um, in, in sort of analyzing what leads to the, the need to build up your own kingdom or, or your struggle to root for rivals um, is that, that, that sense that I'm enough just in God, right? Or that God provides. And so, you know, to give a kind of a parallel example, we often are challenging artists because we work in the art space a lot to use their gifts missionally. You use your art to, to preach the gospel or make a difference. And for years, an assumption we fail we were making was there wasn't an underlying surrender to the idea that i am a full-on deny yourself jesus follower first who who then looks around and says okay you've made me to be able to play guitar how can i use that and so how much of this first needs to be addressed at that heart level of saying that i'm not kind of adding jesus to the things that i'm doing and so on a foundational level, I don't really even have the basis for wanting to deny myself. How much of this is about, dare I say, surrender to even the idea that Jesus is Lord first, and then everything I do is an extension of that? That sure sounds like the starting point to me. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's that's it, right? That's it. And, and the whole thing of, do I actually believe um, Jesus was who he said he was? Do, do I actually believe that because of that, I am adopted into God's family for all eternity. Do I actually believe that? And if I do, whew, I just think that changes the way that we live um, in a wonderful, wonderful way. And just, you know, one kind of practical experiment um, for the two of you. Do you know the name of your great, great grandparents? Can, can you can you tell me the, the names? And and if you, if you do... Um, Go back one more generation. My guess is you don't have to go too far back in any of our stories be before. We don't even know the names of the people that are directly related to us, directly in our line. And, and so maybe this idea of legacy and yeah. all of that, maybe, maybe that's just a modern form of idolatry that we can let go and say, there is one who knows my name. Uh, there is one uh, who has my name engraved the palm of his hand, um, and maybe that matters more than whether or not I am known in this little brief moment of time and I have my five minutes of fame. <laughs> maybe, just maybe that matters infinitely more. Yeah, that's so good. That's such a challenging perspective. I think it's interesting because we live, we do a lot engaging secular culture and young people that would walk into a church, and so many people have an inherent desire to 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 find significance and to be significant. So like the innate desire to do something that matters, that's that's of the Lord, right? But it gets distorted, it gets twisted. Um, but so much of what we talk about is like your desire to be known is is gonna be found in, in a relationship with Jesus. Your desire significance is be found in Jesus. So how much of this, how much do we twist good things or we take things yeah. that are good that are of God and then we twist them because I think that's to me the bigger challenge is because you that's where the self deception comes in. You take something that's good and you twist it. How does ambition or the drive for making a difference and significance where is that good and godly, and where does it become to become that idolatry that you were describing? I have a friend uh, named Chris, and uh, first time I ever heard the word humbition. But I love that word. I love that word. The two ideas that some could feel like they're in contrast. Is it possible to be ambitious or humble? And as if the only option there is or. And I think it's possible to actually, 
uh, see individuals that really are humbitious, that they do have this deep sense of, of rootedness in who they are. There is a, there's a Philippians 2 humility that, that you just see uh, in them. And at the same time, they believe in the work that they're doing. They are excited. And in some crazy way, um, they know God is at work in this world and they don't want to miss out on being part of it. And so they get to work um, on that. And I love those two ideas coming together because there is a lot of good work. But I think for me, the ultimate question is, and what's it for? What is really the motivating sense? And is it out of a sense of I have been loved, therefore let me go with everything that I have and try to love others? Or is it, I'm still trying to earn it. I'm still trying to get my spot. I'm still trying. And the fascinating to me is this um, crazy book in the Bible of Jeremiah chapter 17 has this story of contrast. Um, and, 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 it, and it essentially gives these two word pictures about when the drought comes, when the heat comes. There are some that ended up becoming shriveled shrubs, um, and there are some that end up being fruit trees bearing fruit even in the harshest drought. And what's the difference? One, they turn inward. They try to say, you know, I got this. It's, it's, I'm going to grit it out. I've, I've got what it takes. And the other actually says, my hope, my trust, my identity, it is rooted in a different story. It is rooted in God's love. And that, in my mind, makes all the difference in the world about how well we're able to sustain service, how well we're to handle those disappointments. Don't people see all that I'm sacrificing? Don't they, don't they, why am I not getting the accolades that I want? Someone who finds their identity somewhere else, you know, it's nice to be appreciated, but it's not devastating if it's not because I'm not looking inward there. So Jeremiah 17, it's a fascinating chapter, that section uh, of, of contrast. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm certainly far from getting this right, but I think an appeal I often make to the artists I'm speaking to is that, you know, that that idea of lose your life to find it, that, that there is a brilliance in, in the economy of God, that he really does restore this gift in a way that really is then meaningful. So whatever it is, if it's business, if it's whatever you're doing, when you really do give it, surrender it, then you you can pursue it in a way that actually satisfies. You know, the phrase the phrase I like to use is it's, I'm doing this from wholeness, not for wholeness. That's and I think great. that's such a significant difference because you, you, you know the difference. And the, the, the for wholeness is exhausting. It's hectic. It never ends. We've touched on this a little bit, but could you give some signs in your mind of someone who, who still at the core level is, is doing what they're doing for wholeness, for the things that we're describing? What are some indicators for someone listening who maybe even at this moment, as we've talked about, is maybe self-deceiving them? you know, they're deceiving themselves and they're not even aware or they're just wrestling with it. What would be some indications that, man, we've got to get this core part right so that we even then have the basis for, for doing it God's way? The first three that come to mind. The first, I would actually not talk to the person. I would talk to those closest to them, their closest friends or spouse or kids and say, how well is that individual doing loving you and making sure that they know that you are so important in their life? Um, or is this well-worn pattern that is that needs to end? Has the ministry work become a mistress? Like, so I'd talk to the family members mm. first and say, how well? The second thing is, how well are they able to rest? Are they able to actually, one out of seven, unplug and actually believe the world God loves whoever you're trying to serve or whatever more than you do. And is there a freedom that comes one out of seven? Because if, if, if you're at the center, you're never going to be able to unplug. You're never going to be able to rest. And I wonder if there's some connection uh, there as well. Um, and then the third uh, piece is how do you handle disappointment? Um, how do you feel like you didn't get the recognition or failure or accolades? And if that is crushing to you, as it is for me, far more often than I wish, <laughs> if that is crushing, maybe we're holding on to that item, that aspect, even if it's a good thing, if it's a service, or even if that, maybe I'm holding on a little bit too tightly on that. Mm. That's so good. So practical. I think the one that there that stands, well, all of them do. Yeah, it's quite convicting <laughs> if I'm honest with you. Yeah. The one that really hits me is the, the rest one. Um, and I think that we live in such a frantic, you know, 
seven steps for more efficiency, you know, how to fit 25 hours of work into 24 day, hours of the day, you know, that kind of, that's the world we live in. And so that frantic busyness, you know, it's, you know, even the, the you know, the Chick-fil-A model or even the whole concept of the Sabbath, we will do in six days what the world does in seven. It's a trust in God and not yourself. Um, can, can you tell me how you personally live that life? You, you, you run a big organization with lots of demands. How do you live that? How do you apply that in the way you live your life, the, the rest, the Sabbath? So again, I feel like I need a giant disclaimer. I write because I'm interested in topics that matter a whole lot to me, not because I have figured it out or mastered any of them. So I am definitely on the journey with you guys. I am definitely on the journey. But I think for me, there have been certain practices that I have put in place that really have been helpful. Um, and the first is uh, I've written my, you guys are going to think I'm a little bit crazy, but I wrote my resignation letter. Um, and just as a simple reminder that I, I love what, what I do with Hope International. I, I love the team and believe in the mission. And it is it is the thrilling ride of my life to, to partner with this, this team and do this work. But there's going to be some day when I'm going to turn that letter in. <laughs> and, uh, and what happens then? And if my identity is so wrapped up, that's going to be a crisis that is just waiting to happen. So that reminds me, there's going to be a day that I'm not going to have the title um, or the organization. And and that's okay. And then the next step is I actually wrote my eulogy too, because the ultimate expression of that is, hey, guess what? Guess what? There's going to be a day when when this is over. Um, and what matters then? What are the things that I hope? And it's just David Brooks has this brilliant uh, TED talk about the difference between eulogy virtues and resume virtues. And what matters at the end? It's just not the resume stuff. Um, on that. So th that's a very practical and concrete way that, uh, yeah, I've taken actions to remind myself um, there is more than just what I'm doing right now in, in, in my day to day job, even though I care deeply about this work that I do. Yeah, yeah so I am um, not, I don't, must have been four or five or maybe six months ago. Our, our grandma passed away and I was actually in the room when she when she died. And it was a very surreal experience. I've never, I've never experienced that before. And um, what you're saying is so true. I, I was just struck by sort of this time lapse idea of her life, and that in that moment, in that room, none of it was there. None of it was there, you know. And all she could really take at that point was the life she had lived, the family she's leaving behind, the hopefully the spiritual legacy that she had. And it was just such a powerful moment for me, where I'm like, this is all that's going to be there in the end. This this moment is so powerful and so visceral. And so I, I totally hear what you're saying. And also, you know, this morning I was struck, I've been reading through Romans. Um, and it, it says in, uh, in verse six, in Romans eight it says the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. And peace is in there a lot. And for the first time that really stood out to me, I'm like, when we're living according to the spirit, there's peace. And if I'm honest, I don't feel like I feel that peace as much as I, as I should or as much as I want to. And, and so I don't so much have a question as I just, I feel convicted by that. Is I, I just, how do we get there? And, and maybe this is, this is a question also that relates to this whole topic, which is how can we change the environment and the structure and the culture to help each other, right? Because it feels like part of it is that we've created a culture, even a Christian culture that celebrates the wrong thing, that incentivizes the wrong thing. I mean, if you're a poor pastor today, it's not enough to be a pastor. You got to be good enough to be competing on YouTube. You got to be an author and a social media influencer. And like, how do we change? How can we change the culture? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And I think that for all of us is something that hopefully in our lives, there's there's less of us and there is more uh, of Jesus. And I really think that is the journey that we are on. You know, the one thing that we we kind of hinted on, but just one final thought related to that um, is it's so interesting to me. The night before Jesus went to the cross, he prayed something really specifically. And the prayer on that night was for his disciples. And then he goes and he says, and I pray for those who believe in his name. And that is you. And that is me. And then the prayer is very specific. It's that they would brought be brought to complete unity. 
then the world would know that you have sent me. And I think there's something that we're missing in the world today. We live in a culture of so much division, of so much, so many logos and egos. Look at the platform. Look at me. Look at me. And that drives wedges between us. It drives absolute wedges between us. And I wonder if part of the invitation is to rediscover what Jesus was praying for, that there would be a spirit of oneness among his followers. And I wonder if when the world looks at the church, if they see something different in the way that we treat each other, in the way that we connect with each other, in the way that we sacrifice for each other, I wonder if that would be a shining difference right now when there is so much division. And again, maybe that's because that's what Jesus was praying for. Um, and I just long for that to be true. So again, that to me is part of the great invitation that I just, I, I, I long for less of me, mm. more of, of Jesus and a spirit yeah. of true love of the other um, as we go and as we do this good and important work that we are all doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's even thinking about dealing with this problem on a systemic level is interesting and funny because it feels like our natural response is to then just highlight the unhighlighted and then so doing create the same problem that we're trying to fix. It, this almost has to be worked out individually. You know, we have to come to the Lord and find our satisfaction in him and abide in him because we can't just say, well, okay, well, we need to find the people that are not celebrated and celebrate them and there and, and create different kinds of celebrities. We, we need to fight that whole mentality and say, you know what? I, I often say that I think we're going to get to heaven and the people that we thought were the, <laughs> had the big houses and the mansions and the celebrities, we're going to be like, who, who was that person? Like, I have no idea who that is because we have it so backwards in terms of the way God looks at things. And, and so we have to just, I mean, for me, isn't it to follow Jesus? Isn't it just to daily say, God, I am, I am so deceived. It's so easy for me to fall. Help me to do things the way you did them. Help, where there's a gap between the way you lived and the way I live, let that gap close in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's just a daily, continual thing. Examine my heart. Examine my heart. Because, man, if left to my own devices, it's, I just become sucked right into the patterns of the world. And, and some, for someone who does a lot of content, it's all numbers. It's all viewers. It's all metrics. And it's... And it's all, and there's always someone with more and there's always someone with less. And it's a, it's a rat race if there ever was one. Uh, and so I want that peace that Paul's talking about in Romans. And so I think that only comes with the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. So Peter, I just want to say again, you're, you from a distance and now having this short conversation, you're someone that I look up to and that I, I appreciate as kind yeah. of a leader in the missional Christian nonprofit space. Thank you for yeah. leading, leading us. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I really, I honor you for that and I appreciate you and, and you're, I mean, I've had a lot of conversations with different people. I do a lot of collaboration and I've been like talking about your book and say, we gotta, we gotta do it this way. So thank you for leading and, and being an example in this, in this space. Cause we, you know, we all want to make a difference. We want to use this vapor of time we have on the planet for eternal purposes, but we want to do it the right way. So I just want to honor you and, and thank you. And I really encourage people to check out your book, Rooting for Rivals, as well as some of your other books, like, you know, the, the um, Mission Drift and others, just great stuff. So thank you. Thank you for leading. Thank you for this time to be on this call. And uh, we really appreciate yeah, it. And there it is, Amazon, that tiny little emerging company. Uh, there, there it is. Uh, Rudy for Rivals. Get it now uh, and uh, be warned. Uh, it will challenge you as it challenged us. So again, I echo what Aaron said. Thank you very much. Man, this was a gift. Thank you guys. and Look forward to the next time we're together. Thanks awesome. so much. Yeah. Thanks, All Peter. right. Well, thank you for listening. And uh, you can send us an email at provokeandinspire at sager.org for anything uh, we didn't cover you want us to cover next time. Otherwise, uh, if you want to say goodbye to us, Peter, offline, although we've all kind of been offline here, we'll do that. Uh, but otherwise, we're going to hit this really cool video, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Peace.